Yeah. Parker is headed to follower zero. Follower zero because follow zero. Follow zero. Yeah, follow zero. It's led by Joseph Newgarden, by the way. Saw that. I had already thought of this. Well, hey, let's you know what? We're live. Let's introduce it. We'll talk about it in a second. So, uh, welcome to Money Lap Podcast. I'm Parker Kligerman, joined as always by Landon Castle. This is our podcast about all motorsports. Um, and on today's show, we will talk NASCAR Cup, the incredible Xfinity Series finish. We've got some IndyCar, F1, and a little bit more out there in the racing world that we'll dive into. But we start the PR lap, and Landon, this is where we want to we talk about ourselves. First topic, follower zero, following zero. I want to Park, head to follow eight zero. Parker wants to start the st- Parker wants to start the PR lap with a heavy with a heavy subject <laughs> about how well, well where I was teasing him <laughs> off the air before we hit record. This is the reason we hit record is because he wants to follow nobody, but he wants everybody to follow him. And so he's yes. like, "Look, I just want this to be a one way street. I don't care about what you guys have going on. I just want you to read my stuff." <laughs> and I, what's funny is I'm the opposite. I think hmm. I want to retire from making content and just that's not good. either a <laughs> read content and like when I want to, but then not have any responsibility. <laughs> this so, is not this is not a good situation. So I don't want to consume situation any. We operate a podcast. The, <laughs> what does this mean? The, the, I think the rest of society is going through the same thing, though. I mean, my wife yes. deleted her Instagram for like a month because she's just like it doesn't add any value to my life. Um, Mm -hmm. so she kind of took a little Instagram sabbatical, um, and I've never actually done such a thing, like gotten off social media, quit social media, but there's something to that. But yet here we are full on in the content game with money lab newsletter, podcast, social uh, content on X, all of it. Yep. We do it all. I have, I do have thoughts on this. So first and foremost, I have never done a social media break either. I have at times tried to like limit my use of it because I do feel like your wife that sometimes it's just endless scrolling with no actual value. And I'm like, what am yeah. I doing here? I'd rather just stare into, you know, nature than this thing. But the uh, the part, the thing that's interesting to me is that many years ago, this is probably 10 years ago, I, I told my sister one time, I was like, I think in 10 years it'll be more about disconnecting than connecting. Because we were already already getting so overloaded, right, with social media and that sort of thing. Now that is not exactly panned out, but I do see a little bit of a trend of people talking about this more and more. Like, hey, tracking their time, you're on social media, and all this stuff, right? And so, uh, with that, yes, I think follower following zero is sort of a statement to say I'm I'm going to keep creating stuff. But I'm not going to look at anyone else's stuff. And I don't know how well that works. And I don't know if the social media platforms want that. And I'm not going to do – we're not going to do that yet. I did see Joseph Newgarden do it. And I thought, well, that's interesting. And one thing I did do was I took about – over the course of like three days, uh, maybe a month ago, I unfollowed like 50% of the things I followed on Instagram oh. and on Twitter. And I called it like, and it's still not as little as I want it to be, but I just got rid of so much stuff that I just thought just doesn't add value. I don't know Mm -hmm. why I even follow this thing. I'm due for a purge. Well, and as I've done that, yeah, it's a purge essentially. I mean, I realized Twitter, I've had Twitter since 2009. I'd never done this. Mm. I followed so many things that didn't even exist anymore. And I was like, well, this, this has got to be messing up the algorithm maybe. And then two, I just felt like this doesn't, doesn't even fit me anymore so i uh i did do that i would continue to do that but yeah you you can't stop making it because we do have a podcast that everyone listens to and they love it <laughs> don't worry so thank you all for I listening don't plan on stop making content i just you know yeah i it's interesting um so you just all of this sparked uh, something in my memory here that i want to bring up and i've never really shared this with anybody but uh mm. you know a dear friend of mine Joey Denowitz from NASCAR, who works at NASCAR. Uh, I have a reminder in my phone to revisit on October 20th of year 2025. We're not that far away from that, a year and a half mm-hmm. away. I created this reminder in my iPhone nearly five years ago on October 20th of 2020. 
And the reminder is, has social media fallen yet? Joey Denowitz predicts on October 20th, 2020, by this day in 2025, social media will have fallen. So stay tuned. <laughs> stay tuned. We could be at the end. This, this could be, my this phone. is it. It's scheduled to check social in. Media. So, it's just the Mayan, it's like the Mayan calendar. This is the end <laughs> of the world. everybody that's listening to mark their calendars for October 20th, 2025. We'll have a, uh, um, we need to have like a party on the 24th. Yeah. Or something. Um, but I need everybody to tweet at me or whatever it's called then. It's only a year <laughs> now. So I need everybody well, to tweet at me on October 20th, 2025 um, and find out. What do we need to revisit this? Maybe we can bring Joey on the podcast on the twentieth of twenty twenty five, a year and a half from now, to see if social media has fallen yet. What's going on has in the it, world? Has it fallen? Is Zuckerberg no longer the on the billionaire world, list? What if the world is ruined by then? Like what? <laughs> oh my gosh! I, it's a possibility. Who knows? It's, it actually is still in play. This thing is if still you're in listening. Play. This. Joey. Uh, <laughs> Joey's deal is still in play. You know what? Let's talk about something more positive because I actually had some notes that I wanted to discuss. And this actually has to do with content and connecting with fans because social media is a great way to connect with fans. It's how I've always connected with my fans. Our generation of drivers have connected with our fans through social media. But we still get traditional fan mail. And I tweeted something about fan mail last week um, because I was signing a bunch of fan mail. And I had a lot of really good letters written in my fan mail and i was curious parker what you do with fan mail and like your process uh, what's your signing process how do you handle fan mail you get letters right some of them are handwritten some of them are printed some of them are you know like what the deal is most people are collectors but obviously like there were some that i could tell are resellers um you know do you have any easter eggs with your signature or anything you like what do you do with fan mail i want to hear your thoughts and then we'll just like let's banter about this we'll make this the pr lap because i'm reading through some of the comments and some of the reviews that we got and i'm not really liking what i see here <laughs> so let's talk about <laughs> fan mail for a few minutes <laughs> there was a it was a mean set of comments that we'll dive into in a bit so i'm not as creative as you i remember many many years ago you were super creative in in part doing when we used to do those uh, trading cards that we would get like a mm-hmm. thousand of them they would pay us to sign those things and you would do like personalized notes on each one it was never that cool um my process is usually to wait till they've sat there for about a year and a half and then <laughs> dive in. No, i'm kidding <laughs> that has happened i apologize it's not really part of the process not on purpose just occasionally i've had to move from teams or you know the i now have a po box i've had for the last couple of years that works pretty well but for years, yeah, I have different teams. I didn't have a P.O. box. And so suddenly this team I'd be leaving and they'd be like, oh, by the way, with this huge stack of fan mail, here you go. I'm like, oh, okay, thanks. So, you know, I'd go through it. Um, I've always done one funny thing, which is the a lot of times people will send, like if they have a trading card or something like that, a little note. And it says like, will you please blah, blah, blah. Or they might do like some personalization. Like for me often it was, hey, I love your TV work, that sort of thing. I would take that note and then I would write a note back on it. For the That's last what I years. do. So I always put that back in there on the note I've written, like yeah, I do something the same thing. to say, yeah, thanks for the, you know, the note that meant a lot. Hope you, you know, hope you're well, blah blah, blah and then sign that as well. So mm-hmm. that's been the one particular sort of Easter egg I do. Mm-hmm. Um, but other than that, I can't think of anything that I've done other than sometimes you know throw more cards in there or that sort of thing. What I know you're more. So you just recently did some fun things. What is You've always been very creative with this. So I did um, I did more – actually, I did another round of Panini cards a couple weeks ago. So, And that's not necessarily fan mail. That's That was signing for Panini. Um, so – and I – shoot, I should – this isn't a paid ad or anything, but um, you should definitely check out – well, it can be as paid ad, SpoilerDieCast.com. Gosh, hey. what? I missed it. I missed it. <laughs> Go to SpoilerDieCast.com. <laughs> I don't know if they have Panini cards at SpoilerDieCast, but they should. Maybe at pristineauction.com. Uh, he'll find yeah, them. Yeah, Pristine probably has some collectible uh, di- uh, um, cards anyways. But I, I did a round of Panini cards with their latest release that either is should be coming out here soon. And I think I did some, um, some pretty fun, unique drawings and phrases and signatures on a few of those. Not too many of them, though. So there was one, oh, back in like 2012, I did a whole boatload of them. 
and those are fun. Um, I am a little bit like you on signing fan mail. I'm more consistent about it now than in my younger years. I think I appreciate it more now than I used to. And so when I get fan mail, I typically try to sign it when I get it. Like I don't, mm. I try not to let it pile up. I maybe let it pile up like for a couple of weeks, but when I get fan mail, I just sign it and I put it back in the mail. Um, Cause fans are typically Way really to good make about us how- all that? look bad. Thanks. No, I'm not perfect about it because I'm sure some somebody will be like, well, I sent something two years ago and never got back. And that's very possible. But if it gets to me, I, <laughs> the truth if, comes if out. it gets to me, um, I usually sign it and send it back. Um, I, um, I do the notes exactly like you said. I love writing notes back. But I don't do it on all of them. I do it on the ones that are obviously the most personalized. Um, the... The one thing that I always share with people about my signature that's a little unique is um, I only put a car number if I'm driving that car at the time that I'm signing it. Yep, I do the same thing. So, or, or, oh, you mean even if it's a car that has the old car number? So if somebody sends me a Johnny Davis number four hero card today, I won't Mm -hmm. put the car number on it. I see. I see what you're saying. So they know yep. then it was that time period. Yep. So oh, if that's you, smart. If you ever see my signature and you see a car number on it, then you can know that I was driving that car at the time that I signed that picture. Mm. Makes sense. Makes total sense. Um, and then uh, I actually did something recently because I started noticing some uh, some fan mail I've gotten are a little bit obvious that they might be resellers or a little bit stock photos. So I signed my name and I just put an X on the signature <laughs> and I don't, I'm not trying to, I'm not actually trying to prevent resellers or anything like that. I hope I actually, I wanted to bring more value. So if you, uh, if you see my signature with an X on it, um, just know that I knew that you were going to sell it. And if you put it on eBay, maybe it brings more money anyways. So Why there? You put it on pristineauction.com. Or pristineauction.com. Yeah, that's better than eBay. <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> <laughs> like, like people can tell that we're so bad at this in terms of planning. This, uh, this topic would lead perfectly into our normal ad rates, but we're not going to do that right now because we're going to skip to some other <laughs> stuff. The and then we're going to get to those. So you this just stay tuned. We're real. We're authentic here. We're real we're- authentic. Before you guys run, I I did want to ask you two questions on the topic of fan mail. Have you mm-hmm. guys ever sent fan mail? No. Yes. Wow. Please um, go on. I wrote a letter to what was the show we used to watch when we were kids? And in the part of the song, they sang the address, and it was Boston, Mass. Massachusetts with the, was at the end of the address. Oh my gosh, it was like a PBS show. Ugh. Oh, you mean the Magic School Bus? No, it wasn't Magic School uh, Bus. I, I just know. loved the show on PBS when I was a kid. Arthur? Oh, what was it? Not what Arthur. Arthur. Oh, I loved Arthur though, but it came on like either before or after Arthur. Mm. Shannon uh, would know. My girlfriend, she loves all that yeah. stuff. I can mm. I can almost think I can th- I hear like part of the jingle in my head of the song at the end of the show they would they would ask the viewers to send them a letter and then they would sing the address um and so yeah I think one time I wrote a letter to that show I didn't get anything back but so you just reminded me the closest I've ever come to fan mail would have been trying to get an email or um yes an email I think at the time or it was a forum post on wind tunnel with Dave to Spain I so desperately, when I was like 13, 14, 15, really wanted it to happen, and they never took my email or anything <laughs> and put it on there. But then in 2009, I got in on there as a guest in the Rising Star segment and got to sit with Davis Spade there. <laughs> and I didn't tell that story there, but I wanted to be like, by the way, I've been trying to get on this show for 10 years. <laughs> the show was Zoom. Zoom. Z double O M. Yeah, whoa. I whoa, think that whoa, was part right? of the song. I can't remember. Zoom has a whole new meaning now. Zoom. Yep. Yep. So did so, anything you know, ever come of it? Uh, of the show or of writing the letter? Writing the letter. I don't think I. No, I don't think I got anything back. All right. But and great show. The second question was, what is the most memorable piece of fan mail you guys have ever seen? Good, bad, memorable. 
mm. memorable. I know mine. Gosh, I, I'm ashamed to say that I can't think of one. But I, I am always heartwarmed when I get just a really well personalized letter. And I, and I get like a, I had, I had two letters in this batch of fan mail um, last week that were, it was like a dad writing and talking about his son, him and his son, you know, watch racing, and they both they root for me, and um, that's like, you know, just really sticks with me. So I was gonna say, yeah, my most memorable, memorable was memorable, Mem- memorable was a um, letter I got after Swan Racing had folded in 2014. And probably one of my lower moments in motors in my career, kind of wondering like, what am I going to do in my life? And I got a four page handwritten letter from this young girl that I remember used to follow me. And I think I'd seen her at autograph sessions, that sort of thing. And mm-hmm. it was like so personal and, you know, so encouraging and that sort of thing. And I remember it kind of brought me to tears. So that's cool. It was like, that was a really cool one. I uh, I never forgot that. So and I actually still I know it's somewhere. I have it somewhere, even though I've moved since then. All those things, it's it's located somewhere because I was like, I'm not throwing this out. This was this was really sweet. So that's my most memorable. Um, speaking of memorable outreach, we did not have <laughs> any new reviews on Apple in our quest to 200. We're at 152 re- five star reviews, all five stars, of course. Um, so please help us get to 200. I joined Cameo at 100. If you like this podcast, share it with some friends. Get them to review it on Apple Reviews or on Spotify, wherever they want to listen, or on YouTube. Just join our ecosystem here. Tell them about Money Lap. Speaking of which, on Spotify, this pers- this listener, Landon, has a bone to pick with you. <laughs> so I, I think... Well, I don't really... I don't... <laughs> <laughs> I'm... You can't know, cut, me off. I'm, I'm gonna, cut uh, me off. I'm cutting you off. I'm cutting you off. <laughs> Okay, Forest. apparently I talk over you, and I'm talking over you now, and I did yep. it intentionally because I know you're about to read this <laughs> review that is extremely upset that I talk over you. And the worst part about it is, yes, I know, and I'm sorry. I get excited, and I want to talk and hear myself talk and all that stuff, whatever. Um, but the worst I, part me, about this is yep. that today I didn't bring headphones, and I talk over you worse yes. than when I don't have <laughs> headphones on. So on the day that we're reading a review that's calling me out for talking over Parker and needing me to settle down and just not rush the conversation, I didn't even wear headphones, which is going to make it worse. So bear with us for one more episode, and then I'll get focused, and I will have patience, and I will – I need to talk to a therapist. You didn't even let me read it. (laughs) I know. That was was part of the bit. Forest something. I don't even know what the second part of this is. No, I don't even want you to read it. No, I, have to I made the it. point. the The point has been made. All right, we don't need, right, to, right. we don't need to dwell on this. <laughs> all right, all right, all right. <laughs> we'll move on. YouTube. Uh, we, see, I don't talk about you that much. No, it's it's not terrible. It's it was worse when you <laughs> didn't have when you didn't have headphones for a while, like you don't have right now. So we we do use the internet to do this podcast, as we are constantly in seventy two different locations at times. Um, so. We, you know, the internet only has so many ways that we can connect and, and keep it together, but headphones help. Let's go to YouTube. Um, Rhino Racer, Room 66, said, Video has been out seven hours. Why are there only 13 likes? Thankfully, it went way higher than that, by the way. It is not cool to like the video. What the hell? Hey, once again, if you like, if you like what we're doing, like, subscribe, share it with your friends. You know, only can help us. And Chad Akins, once again, this was around the same video. So you have to remember with the YouTube videos, um, they are there is an algorithm that we're dealing with on those. So we are trying to get better at it. But sometimes you might see a video do really well. Sometimes they don't. And it's not really up to the subscribers. It's more about YouTube's algorithm. And if they choose to notify you that we've put a video up and that sort of thing. So Chad Akins, 60 said, uh, why can't you guys get any subscribers, <laughs> which I do find a little offensive considering we have a lot of subscribers. We've been growing quite handily each month, <laughs> but we agree we need more. Uh, we can always use more. We'd love to have more. So if you like what we're doing, once again, share it with some friends. And if you want to reach out to us directly, friends at com is our email. Send us it there. We'll put you on the podcast. Unlike mm-hmm. Dave Despain and Wind Tunnel, you will get on this podcast if you send us an email. Uh, mine never made it there, Landon. So 
Now I have a podcast to, to say what I want to say. Oh, and hit the bell icon on YouTube. Do that. That helps a lot if you're on YouTube. Hit it. Hit it now. Thank you. So that will give you notifications. I think we did that well. We connected it. Can I talk now? You're allowed now. Yes, go. Okay. <laughs> Parker needs to post more pictures of his himself shirtless on social media to get more <laughs> subscribers. <laughs> um. <laughs> so, so wait, before you go any further, good buddy of mine, listener of the pod, uh, sent me a thing and said, um, do you remember posting this? <laughs> <laughs> oh, my gosh. What a beautiful insult. I thought it was amazingly – I thought it was fun. That's you a great it, comedy. You're going to lead into the whole, you know, hey, I'm sponsored by Spike Light Coolers, which are fun, and they're all about being out and having a good time and being in the fun in the sun. You know what? I'm going shirtless. So yeah. that's what we did. And you can catch Money Lap on OnlyFans uh, for our shirtless <laughs> version of the podcast. <laughs> oh, my gosh. Well, speaking of – yeah websites that we don't need to go to but if you want to talk about a website that you should go to you should go to spoilerdiecast.com one of the fastest growing companies in the diecast industry they pride themselves on exceptional service all orders ship either same or next day ensuring you get your hands on your favorite products in no time that's spoilerdiecast.com they've got over a thousand what where are we at now 1100 thousand 1100 <laughs> 1100 <laughs> unique socks. They got a they have a ton of inventory. They've been investing in inventory at spoilerdiecast.com. Um which I appreciate. You know, when I was a kid growing up, diecast in the mall was like the thing. That was the thing. Yep. And then we lost that for so long. They just they just kind of died out. The only places where you you can still have those like classic collectible store experiences, I think is when we go to the northeast, you know, in New Hampshire and Pennsylvania and New York and stuff like there's still some classic collectible stores around there, but spoiler diecast.com is kind of filled that gap for me. Now um, they have a brick and mortar store in, in Fort Wayne, Indiana. And then obviously spoiler diecast.com, which is their original um, online e-commerce platform for buying your favorite NASCAR, IndyCar, F1, dirt sprint cars. They're passionate racing fans. They've got everything. They're growing their offerings. Um, great company, been partners of the pod since the beginning. So, spoilerdiecast.com, check them out. Love spoilerdiecast.com. And a reminder, as I do each time, you can get the Spike Light Coors number 48 Camaro from the Xfinity series that I drive on there right now. You can pre order it and you can do, even do the special edition to get me to sign it. So, pretty cool. Love those guys over there. And they're growing like crazy, which is awesome. Um, so, Landon, I have to tell you that something interesting happened this past week. Kyle Larson won his third pole in a row in the NASCAR Cup Series, right? Did he really? Yeah, pretty impressive. And across a variety of tracks, that's the, more, the most impressive part. But the, his comment afterwards is what really caught my eye because he is participating in two of the races on the greatest day in motorsports, right? Memorial Day weekend, Monaco GP in the morning, Indy 500 in the afternoon, and then the Coke 600 in the evening. Well, when he was asked – about going 220 miles per hour, which he did last week in the IndyCar test that they only had for a couple hours. He was P2 on the board. And then jumping back in the stock car, he said, actually, the stock car felt faster because the track at Texas is so sketchy and edgy and that sort of thing. He was like, it's, this actually feels harder and faster than mm -hmm. going 220 because it was a cloudy day. There was a ton of grip for the IndyCars, that sort of thing, which I thought was amazing. And really, truly makes me realize just how insane of a talent he is. Mm -hmm. You know what's also insane? What? Being a listener of this podcast, knowing about the greatest day in motorsports, how Kyle Larson is participating in it, and not entering our giveaway from oh Christine Auction. You yeah. need to go there right now to prstn.co slash moneylap. Sign up for this giveaway. We are giving away four awesome items from Pristine Auction. That is a Jeff Gordon signed helmet, a Charles Leclerc signed photo from the Monaco GP, a Johnny Rutherford signed magazine, and a Dale Earnhardt signed ticket from the Coca-Cola 600. Go to prstn.co slash moneylap. Sign up for this giveaway. Enter it for the greatest day in motorsports. And if you are a big-time collector and you want to get some Landing Castle signed cards that maybe have an X on them, you can head to Pristine Auction, which is the choice for unique memorabilia across all sports. You can join a community that values quality service and scoring great wins 
And if you use the code MONEYLAP at Pristine Auction, you get $10 off your first win. That's pristineauction.com. So P-R-I-S-T-I-N-E-A-U-C-T-I-O-N.com. Go there, register, let your collection speak for itself, and enter our giveaway at prstn.co slash MONEYLAP for the greatest day in motorsports. I think that got an A+, plus, by the way. And speaking of the NASCAR Cup Series and and uh, Kyle Larson being on the pole, oh boy. So <laughs> where do we dive into this one? Chase Elliott, the winner mm-hmm. of this great cup race at Texas. And that's pretty funny to say because <laughs> last week, heading into Texas, all people wanted to talk about is how much they hated Texas Motor Speedway mm-hmm. and how awful it was and that it doesn't put on a good show and it you know the track looks like a war zone essentially um in terms of its you know the the asphalt and how it's been resin and PJ1 put all over it but that was a show once again the next gen car put on an excellent show and we got a winner who broke a winless streak i thought mm-hmm. pretty good which changed the narrative here and i actually saw that Jeff Gluck's poll it was like 72 point some odd percent said it was a good race, which makes it the number one Texas race in X number. Josh can look it up, amount of races mm-hmm. that the, the poll has been there. Where do we go with this? I don't know. <laughs> I see Josh's <laughs> notes in here. Texas, why are you the way that you are? <laughs> so good. Oh, <laughs> uh, what a love hate relationship with Texas. I mean, I. I just, I don't know. I don't know about new Texas. I miss old Texas. I just mm. miss turn one. Just give me turn one and two back. It was epic. It was when such a good the corner. Bottom with the it left front. It was such a good corner. Oh, and, so and good. And they Kentucky-fied it. And it it just is, you know, I don't know. It's not a good corner. And, and I think that the one thing that is making texas interesting that wasn't new this weekend we just saw a highlight of it this weekend i think is the the traction compound you described it perfectly has made this track unlike really anything else right it's 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 a war zone you have this no go zone you have a no man's land outside of that groove you have this weird sort of inconsistent grip level of pavement underneath the groove. And then even the traction compound groove itself, even without applying anything to it is still like inconsistent has residual. And it just, you know, where you got to hand it to the racetrack and we have to admit as drivers is that variability and that unpredictability. That's what we like. That's what we want as race car drivers. Like that is a version of what we like when we say we like tracks with old pavement, right? Because when we say we like tracks with old pavement, old Atlanta, right? Why did we like that? Because the track was unpredictable. The pavement was unpredictable. It was patchy. It was inconsistent, right? That's what we liked about it. So that's what we're getting out of Texas Motor Speedway right now. Now what's frustrating about Texas Motor Speedway is – it's still the more variability this will get better but it still feels like there's not a lot of options right you have like mm-hmm. the bottom you have the second groove and you have no man's land right so it's ve- it's just edgy and difficult but hey i mean that cup race was was interesting i mean <laughs> it, yeah. it it still has that mile and a half texas capability of just getting strung out you can still take a nap throughout the middle of the race like it you know what I mean? Like it still has mm-hmm. that sort of classic 500 mile type race feel, even though it wasn't 500 miles, but um, it was a 400 mile race, right? Uh, You're testing my memory. I I'm I'm stopped sure. paying attention to. I'm pretty sure it was 400, 400 miles, um, <laughs> but it, it it still has that feel. But you know, when it came down to it, and the, and when it was when the pay window was open, as Clint Boyer likes to say on the broadcast, uh, but he ain't times. Mine, Like when <clears throat> when they opened the pay window. It, the racing got interesting. Um, I will, the one thing I don't like a little bit, and we can talk about, you know, three and four and that bump, and that bump has gotten me in three and four. I backed it in there with the next gen car, and it was a painful wreck for me. Um, it's the, the, 
that leader, that position, um, that the the leverage that Chase had over Denny there was indefensible. Like mm-hmm. Denny had no chance, and that's disappointing. That's the, that's one part of it that's frustrating as a driver. Yep. But um, you know what's funny is New Texas, Old Texas exit of turn two is a is a corner unlike any other. <laughs> like yeah, the wreck that we see off a of turn two at New Texas has always existed at Texas, and yep. and that's funny to me because that corner could not be any diff any more different than it used to be. <laughs> Yet the same incident will happen with drivers off of that corner. It's 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 pretty cool, um, and and really poses a great challenge. The Byron. Uh, Chastain, I'm just rolling right through this. So yeah, well, hold on. The, Before you yeah. go, I'm going to stop you now. Hold on. Go ahead. Let me say some. Let me, so first and foremost, that corner it is a decreasing radius, like it used to be, essentially mm-hmm. on the exit. So I think that's some of why you see what happens there because it sort of the wall sort of comes at you real quickly, and so you see sort of the what we'll get into the instant between Byron and Chastain. I think the other thing you pointed out well, it is the variability that creates the racing we saw, and it's the same variability that mean that happens because. You know, that allows, like myself, I was running 15th to start the race. I found the mm-hmm. top groove in three and four before anyone else. Boom, I went to 10th in like four laps. Mm-hmm. <laughs> I lit it up. And suddenly I'm the fastest car on the racetrack. That's the sort of thing that exists sort of because they did what they did. And I was I was brave enough to go up there, which I don't, I don't think there's a valor in that. I think it was maybe slightly stupid, but I had to do something to try and get stage points. Mm-hmm. The, the, the other side of that, and what I think was different this weekend, and even a massive difference than last fall, was the tire wear this weekend was high. It was a second to a second and a half of fall off, which we didn't quite have as much in the fall. And it is happening. It, this track is changing at a rapid rate. I mean, when we got there for practice on Friday, I literally got out of the car and said, I don't recognize this place. Like, I don't even know what I'm driving. Because it felt mm-hmm. so different, so low grip, had so, you know the the tire wear and the tire fall off was immense in practice. The it, it just was shocking to me, and I, I, and there was bumps in three and four that I had not felt last year that were getting worse, and I was like, this is interesting. Something's happening here, and it's happened mm-hmm. really quickly. Mm-hmm. They have they have tried to pull up a lot of that stuff. I think in the the resin, the PJ1 sort of thing, because you can see where they've tried to clean it almost. Pull like, up. Well, I think it's just like they've tried to clean the track in areas a little bit, it looks like, and it didn't affect that at all. I, I felt like that was exactly the same as last year in terms of it would activate after mm-hmm. getting heated up for a while. But with the cup cars, it, because they're so finicky and they're especially so bad behind each other with the the, the, the air, the wake of the air is being so concentrated that that resin lane just allows them to sort of have that multi-groove racing that mile and a half that seems to work and then you add in a little bit of fall off and it seems to me like a place that could be heading somewhere sort of interesting the key will be if that top top groove in say three and four like the third groove starts to ever, ever come in i don't know how that happens because right now and I saw Shane Van Giesbergen after the Xfinity race, and he had such a funny comment because he got shoved up there one time. And then <laughs> I got shipped up there at the end of the race when I was on old tires. And he was like, mate, it's like ice. <laughs> I was like, it is. It's legitimately well, ice. I had not hit it yet, by mm-hmm. the way. I'd never been up there. I just had always avoided it last year and in the cup races I'd done there. But when I hit it, uh, when I got shipped up there, I couldn't believe it. I almost spun mm-hmm. out. Twice trying to get down, just trying to yeah. get down back to the track. And I was like, this is insane. So it's it's in an interesting spot. It is changing rapidly, and I don't think there's anyone else out there that – I've listened to a lot of the, the commentary out there in the last two days. I haven't heard enough people talk about how fast this place is changing. And that means we're very much an unknown – sort of an mm. uncharted territory with it. I think it can go one of two ways. It can become such a high tire wear without the ability to move up that it becomes a single groove thing again, and that's a problem. But if we are heading towards even higher tire wear and you can then move the groove and we continue to do that, this place could be really interesting. But I don't, we'll see. <clears throat> I just don't see anything outside of that resin lane ever having grip. Like Potentially I just never, don't see Unless it. we got forced. I mean, the track would have to be... I, I feel like it needs... 
it will take decades of wear on the pavement for that pavement to wear out so much that you now are want to venture into the unused pavement, pavement above it. I th- or I, th- I think that that resin has just contributed so much to grip. Uh, get forty of those school cars on the and start. <laughs> for three months running them in those lanes and just (laughs) running and running and running thousand milers a day maybe you might have a chance i think it could work that stuff in and you'd be flying up there like three and four if you could move up even higher to the higher banking and be flat you would rip oh my gosh (laughs) <laughs> oh my gosh well we talked you know we touched on it earlier and we don't have to spend too much time on it we can can't kind of move on beyond this but um the byron chastain incident at the end i didn't yep. really from the angle looking you know back towards turn two like the live shot of it looked like byron just sort of ran him over but i don't i don't think so i think chastain kind of missed the exit there um it's a really tough exit it's flat <clears throat> it's really hard to change directions or slow down if you need to suddenly. And that's part of why that corner has so many wrecks that look just like that. I don't think Byron did anything wrong there. I don't think there's anywhere for him to go. Um, you know, I'm sure Chastain was frustrated. He may still be frustrated with Byron, but I don't, I don't think Byron did anything wrong. Yeah. And I think the end of these races like that, you're, you're trying to cut each other off and that's where you're going to see, some of these moves, you know, that end up in a little bit of contact. And it's a bit of a racing thing. Um, right. You know, I just don't think of Byron as someone that's going to go dump someone on the last lap of a race like that. It just, I don't know if he, he doesn't seem to, he doesn't seem to strike me as someone to do that, especially with the amount of success he's having right now. He's not yeah. in a frustrated position or mindset that to me, it seems like a racing incident. Um, mm-hmm. Although Josh says clearly we've never raced him on iRacing. So maybe his maybe his reputation I race seems a little a little worse. We did mention the winner, by the way, Chase mm-hmm. Elliott. Um, one person on this podcast, I, I'm trying to think of who called this on on Thursday. Oh was my it? gosh, we don't have to dwell on this. Well, I mean, I'm just putting it out there. Guy breaks a winless streak of wh- how many races was he at, Josh? You you said forty before the podcast, so I can try and get I don't know an if that's correct. Number. I think it's 40. All I'm saying is called the guy to get to break it. And, you know, there was others in the industry didn't see it happening. And I'm just putting out there went out on the limb. So this is this is the time. It's 42. Great American Speedway. 42. 42 races broken. The Great American Speedway. Come on. America's driver. Chase <laughs> Elliott. The, with America's restaurant. Hooters. You're- your reaction in our in our group chat was hilarious. You, it sound. I think you were yeah. more excited to win that race and pick him to win the race than Chase was himself. <laughs> yeah, I had about five spiked light coolers by that point. So I was, I was oh my god. Good. <laughs> <laughs> anyway, um, I think you know to sum up what we're seeing there with the next gen car and such. It the the sport is an in, is an interesting crossroads here. Because this car was purposely made to make mile and a half racing better. It has done that. There is no doubt that is its bread and butter, multi-groove, mile and a half racing. Mm -hmm. It is full of chaos and ability for drivers to run side by side for lap after lap. And it it is putting on a good show. It is struggling at short tracks, road courses potentially, where it maybe, you know, is more, is not on edge. So, yet the sport has moved away for mile and a half in the last couple of years because of where they were so dominant and weren't putting on the best shows for years. I think the key right now is for no to everyone to take a breath, <laughs> start mm-hmm. to understand that this is really special, that there is a, there is a fair amount of them still. Let's not just suddenly start, you know, building Chicago lands and Kansas speedways everywhere and talking mm-hmm. about bringing them back. I think there's some things to be learned though for sure and to celebrate that when you go to Vegas and Kansas and now Texas and maybe we'll see if Texas continues and Homestead and that sort of thing, that you're going to see a very compelling show. And that's a great thing. And it's probably the right amount. Mm-hmm. We can go to work on the other stuff. Yeah, it's good. Uh, intermediate product is really good. Let's keep moving here. Uh, All right. Uh, well, we we do have an Xfinity race to talk about. It feels like we just talked about it because we did a React video already <laughs> of the Xfinity race. So if you're used to watching yes. our React videos, we pick races from history, races from... Formula One, other forms of motorsports. 
a lot of NASCAR stuff. But this week we did a react video of this race in Texas because it was an instant classic. And it, it was, was a heartbreaker for for Sieg to miss it. Um, you know, to lose out on his first win by what? An inch? Two inches? Probably an inch. Is it, it had to be maybe an inch. Um, such an awesome finish. Uh, I actually didn't say much about my race yet. And we always get in trouble if I don't talk about my race, by the way. So now <laughs> this is in the Xfinity Series section that we'll talk about this. Uh, just quickly, I started back at 16th, I want to say. Just underdrove turn one in qualifying. Got in the race. Drove up in the top 10 for stage one. Pitted, restarted, had a major vibration that got worse and worse. Ended up having to come down pit road because I felt like the right front was probably going to fall off. We changed that, and um, we, you know, we had a we we got back sort of in phase with everyone in terms of strategy wise in stage three. It looked like mm-hmm. we were going to finish seventh, I think, if it went mm-hmm. green to the end. Um, but the race had other plans. There was a caution. <laughs> we had no more tires left, so for the second week in a row, I had to restart up at the front of the field with 40-lap older tires than everyone else, by the way. You're Didn't supposed die to do that the other way around. You're supposed yeah, to do no, the it'd be, it'd be wonderful, wonderful to have that tires. With, with, tires. With, yeah, when everyone else does it, that'd be great one time. I did see a fan, some fans on Twitter were like, when will this guy stop trying this move? And it's like, well, I'm not <laughs> trying anything. We just don't have any tires left. <laughs> so... We would have survived, I think, to finish 10th to 15th after the first restart. But the second one, when I was in the middle of the pack, I got absolutely shipped twice. And, you know, you're a second slower than everyone, and they just want to get moving on. So uh, we had a lot of speed. We I actually passed Sam Mayer twice in the first portion of the race. So I, f- I feel a little, little beat up. He, goes, he put it all together to go get the win, which is good for him. But, um, you know, overall... I think we had a lot of speed. It was a hurtful day in terms of the points. We went from 7th and ninth, mm-hmm. So we've got some work to do to, to dig back out of that. And a shame because the place I felt like we had, a, we were going there thinking we had a shot to win. and mm-hmm. Or be a place that we could obviously put on a top five performance. Um, so that was a bummer. And we, uh, we move on to Talladega, which is wonderful. But speaking of the Xfinity Series, man, I... I tweeted about this afterwards with this finish, and I've said it many times, and I'll say it again on here. This series is classic stock car racing. It's the best series. It's amazing. It's just yeah. – it's there's there's a huge amount of competition. It's very hard. It's a high level of competition. You have a good mix of young drivers and drivers that are – you know this is the place they want to be in their career. Um, and I, I do have a sense that that's actually growing in some respects, which is kind of interesting. Uh, we can dive into that. And – it's really because of the separation from Cup in terms of the car. It has developed its own identity, and mm-hmm. it's no longer sort of Cup light. It's sort of this like secondary. I, I call it classic stock car racing because it's it's what mm-hmm. we knew as a stock car. But it's definitely you know building this identity and what perfect timing with it yeah. going to the CW next year and at the end of this year. So for the final eight races of the season, NBC has relinquished those races to the CW, and so. They'll get a head start, which is great for NASCAR because NBC is doing you know, a massive solid in terms of being able to promote that these races be on the CW a year ahead of time. Um, but then you know, as it heads that way, and it's no longer on a network that's just doing cup, you know, doing it because they also do cup, mm-hmm. this series is going to continue to get its own identity. And mm-hmm. it, on a ratings basis, minus the Indy 500, it is so you know, very much in second place in the United States in motorsports viewership, mm-hmm. right there with Formula One when they have big weekends. Um, and so I, I think it has a serious chance for NASCAR to sort of keep doing this. Here's my question to you off that. I just thought of this in the pod. So the one thing that a, a series like this that forever was the second tier series, it will continue to be, there's a natural ceiling of the NASCAR Cup Series. Mm-hmm. But if you think of all those other series, they have their... The, and what just happened this past weekend in golf, the Masters, they all have their marquee event. There's the Daytona 500 for the Cup Series. There's the Indy 500 for IndyCar. There's the Monaco GP for F1. Right. Could a series like Xfinity develop its own marquee event? Oh. Um, or is that not possible? Because of the know. Daytona 500. Yeah, it's hard. Um, it's hard for it to... You know, I think it could. I think it could. What would I it be? I feel like we could have a marquee event that's, you know, that's unique and 
doesn't share a weekend with Cup, right? Um, and I feel like there's it's it's it has in the past. It's it's um, I'm trying to think of an example. Well, there's of, standalone races, of right. course, right? I, I feel like there's been standalone races in the past that have sort of risen to the top as, like, I don't know if it's like maybe the Road America or international racing. Mexico, Canada. That's what I think of immediately for no, marquee yeah. events. A good point. Yeah, you know, yeah. like those kind of, you know, they kind of stand out from the crowd because that they, they don't share a weekend with Cup, and they're the only, you know, um, they're the only NASCAR race in town, and so they sort of fill that space and they become that important. I think Montreal sort of had, you know, had, could have been something like that had it stayed for 10 to 15 years and never had the competition of a cup race, but that's just not, that's not going to happen probably. So maybe that's where it would be difficult for Xfinity to ever be, have a true marquee event because I think that NASCAR, unless NASCAR's intention was to be like, okay, we want to make this a marquee event for Xfinity and we don't want to ruin it. Yeah. Um, but I think that if, if, if it happened organically, NASCAR would naturally want to take the cup series to that venue right mm -hmm. which would steal the thunder um so i think nascar would have to sort of intentionally create a marquee event for the xfinity series um but you know to your point and to sort of wrap a bow on this conversation how much we love the xfinity series it is a um the xfinity series may not be the destination but it is a destination yep it it absolutely is you know especially now like you have drivers that um are are choosing to stay in the Xfinity series. Ryan Sieg and Justin Allgaier and um, you know Riley Herbst, like they're developing their careers in the Xfinity series. Austin Hill, you know, I, I had another like, driver say it to me yesterday. That's what they want to do. Yeah, and I was like, um, really? I, like, yeah, I, I share I that be opinion myself. Like, I love Cup racing. Um, I you know I feel like I I hope that I haven't driven in my last Daytona 500, but uh, I would feel like I'd much rather be in the Xfinity series racing for wins and racing with that group and driving those cars sometimes. Um, yep. I don't know. You know, it's hard to turn down a cup ride though. I've experienced that in my life and <laughs> well, I had this conversation well, with drivers in my life. That's like, yeah, yep. you can talk all you want until you're facing two, <laughs> two opportunities. And one of them is a cup ride. Uh, it's just hard to turn down a cup ride. That's, that's the funny part. That's what I always, I was thinking when they told me this, I was like, yeah, I get that. But with the right cup ride was there. I have to think <laughs> it would look differently. I think that's what the natural ceiling is for the series, mm -hmm. right? Not to be a homer. I feel very privileged to be there. And, you know, I think it's really cool and it's a really cool place to be. And it's cool to see this series getting its own identity and not just being this sort of, you know, throwaway second tier thing. Right. And I think it's, it's a really interesting place for NASCAR, you know, take me out of it, take us as drivers out of it. I don't know. There's no other motorsport that's ever had this. I can tell you that. There's no other motorsport that sat there and said, wait a second, we have our main product, like a Cup Series. It is the marquee, top level, boom, boom, boom. But then we also have this incredibly valuable thing that was supposed to be second tier, mm -hmm. but is sort of developing its own path. And what do you do? Like, how do you... How do you, you know, how do you handle that? I think it has to be an interesting discussion in terms of you know what you can run with it and the, what the opportunities are with that um, in developing something like a marquee event or that sort of thing. So, pretty cool. Um, but we'll uh, we'll see where it all goes. And I think that, you know definitely having a partner like the CW will allow those sorts of things to happen or mm -hmm. or not. Right where yeah you you are gonna it's gonna be their level of investment will also help sort of chart that path to say we want this to develop its own stars and and to be a standalone thing so kind of interesting um yeah. in the truck series kyle bush won for the ten thousandth time by the way <laughs> which hey by the way that's what the truck series used to be what we're talking about with the xfinity series mm -hmm. but that has yeah. gone away in almost every capacity Back in the you early know. 2000s, like the mid 2000s, people would, you know, used to say the truck series had the best racing. Yep. Yep. Um, which is funny because we're so critical of NASCAR's pursuit of like tapered spacer intermediate tracks and high downforce and wide open racing and like all the side drafting, all the stuff. We're so critical of NASCAR trying to accomplish that in the Cup Series. 
but yet we back in 2005 we used to say that the truck series was the best racing and that's literally what that racing is <laughs> it's wide open at every super at every speedway it's yeah you know high down fours tapered spacers they've always been that way that's so funny it, yeah we are uh this is this is why nascar shouldn't listen to any of us this it's is just, why they should do their what own they thing. want to do just do exactly. their thing don't listen to anyone <laughs> just let us talk on our podcasts and <laughs> we'll just <laughs> all, all of the fans can just look back and forth on like who do we trust who do we listen to trust no if, one listen to if them. anyone's been listening well that's if NASCAR's listening and you listen to the beginning of this podcast, you need to go to following zero NASCAR. <laughs> yeah, don't pay attention. Do just your put thing. your own content out there and, and yeah, <laughs> don't listen to anyone else. <laughs> oh my gosh. Um, Speaking of listening to people. Yes. You want to introduce you, you take this, take it well, over. Well, you know, speaking of listening to people, so hopefully we, uh, hopefully they are, hopefully they aren't. I don't know, but there was a tire test at uh, North Wilkesboro. Um, and Logano had an interesting quote about this. He said they were wearing until they weren't. It's crazy to me that 10 degrees was everything. He's talking about the temperature. And what a what a great – I know we're not – we don't have much more information than that. And there is a link to the um, – on Reddit if you want to find more on his quotes on, from SiriusXM. But – it, it it's a really good point that he's making about how fragile and fickle these tires are and how sensitive everything is. And, you know, I do think it want, makes me want to kind of level set with everybody because we're all so emotional after these races talking about it and this and that. Goodyear should do this. And everything is speaking in absolutes, right, as if it was all planned out and happened intentionally. But at the end of the day, like, the the sun popping out and being a 70 degree day as opposed to a 50 degree day in the springtime which is very possible right one day from the next in the middle of spring at these racetracks can absolutely make the difference on whether you have a track that builds rubber and lays down black rubber or just completely wears the tires out and is a one groove super fast track with hardly any fall off like it is it is a tricky thing to balance um if you're trying to this is not the best word to use, but manufacture the race, right? If you're trying to yep. design the race to have a certain type of characteristic, um, there's a ton of variables there. It's difficult, and that's why tires are so difficult. And this is why last week we talked about the craziness of series maybe owning their own tires and just and manufacturing themselves so that they have a, a larger operating window, right, in terms of what's good or willing to let them fail because – it's such a hard thing, and temperature, as Logano alluded to here, at 50 degrees, there was one second of drop-off because they were graining the tire, but at 65 degrees, there was no fall-off mm -hmm. because it wasn't graining the tire. So that's where the tire is either getting too hot, not hot enough. There's all these factors that play into tire and wear mm -hmm. and that sort of thing, and it's just, just it's a very complex sis situation that if you are, once again, talking about incentive structure, Goodyear, you're going to lean to the side of not having it you know, tear itself apart and that sort of thing because that's their incentive. And they, they, there's no nothing wrong about that. One thing I do want to point out, uh, Denny Hamlin said on his podcast this week, because everyone's got a podcast, um, that there was a meeting between NASCAR and the drivers in the Cup Series and uh, some of the track officials and Goodyear were there. And basically the message was that they were going to focus more on tires for short tracks than trying to change aero. Horsepower hmm. has been put as a no-go they're not adjusting horsepower um but that they are focused on tires and that's why goodyear was there and and tracks meaning maybe working with specific tracks on the what the tire build is for that track and that sort of thing mm -hmm. it's obvious that bristol lit the fire on this yeah what we saw there and i i, I we, once again i i don't want to beat a dead horse but i'm going to say the same thing i said last week which is until proven otherwise We've been saying this in same thing for 25 years, and the incentive structure is still wrong for this to go the way they want it to go. Mm -hmm. But we'll see if well, it happens. Well, you're right about that. You're right about that, but I, I think that my takeaway from Denny's comments there and the focus on tires, I, I'm, I'm, I appreciate hearing that. I appreciate the, the, uh, the self-awareness there for everybody in the, the direction. It seems like if, that, if everybody's on the same page, then that makes me optimistic about the outcome. Um, and I could probably tell you that Bristol was probably put a pin in the horsepower conversation 
because yeah. <laughs> nobody left Bristol asking for more motor. Right. <laughs> it was all about tire there. So that's a really good, uh, that's an interesting point. And so if that is the focus, uh, hopefully they get the outcome they're looking for. And the limiting factor th at that point will be what you're saying, Parker, which is the incentive structure. At what, where does Goodyear finally get pushed to their limit of like, yeah, we're not comfortable doing that. Yep. Um, exactly. And that will do be, they get pushed to their limit. I don't know. We'll see. But if the focus is so. on tires, it will be, it makes it, it should be something interesting to see what NASCAR continues to come out with. What Goodyear continues to come out with and announce before these short tracks of like, okay, here's our plan. Here's our tire for this race. It will be, it will be fun to watch as it, as they go down this path and really try to create the serious tire wear that we saw and everyone on the same uh, page with it. So let's move into the open wheel world. And specifically, Formula One, which will be heading to China this coming weekend, by the way. I think it, uh, I think the race is like 3 a.m. on the East Coast. <laughs> so for the most dedicated viewers that will be watching it live, um, we will, uh, there will be the Chinese Grand Prix for the first time since 2019. But the biggest news this week comes out of Mercedes. And no, they didn't sign a new driver to put besides George Russell yet. <laughs> the they, the the shocking news is all about money in the fact that Mercedes Grand Prix Limited, which is basically their version of LLCs, declared a turnover, and that is the British term for revenue, by the way, of five hundred and forty six point five million pounds, which Josh has not given me the conversion on that, but maybe that's close to a bill. Seven hundred and fifty million, I want to say. It's a lot of money. Um, that's what I know. Which covers their year that ended December thirty first. So I believe this is one of the largest, I mean, if in terms of when we've been, tra you know, people have been putting this out publicly because of the whole budget cap and all that stuff and being a publicly mm -hmm. traded company. I believe that's one of the larger revenue numbers that's been seen in F1 ever. More more evidence that they uh, obviously are being flush with money. So It's, a, it's about $680 million. $680 million? You made me look stupid. I thought the conversion rate was like <laughs> two to one, but apparently not. It, 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 to be Jeez. sure, it has dropped over the last couple of weeks, so. See, I well, there you go. So, for you <laughs> listeners, I'm smarter than that sounded. It is. I I wasn't keeping up with the conversion rate. I I didn't check the Financial Times this morning. Of course, duh. Sorry, guys. Um, the uh, the profit is what surprises me. That how does a race team even have any profit margin? Well, they have a big budget cap, so that helps. Wow, the budget cap. That's interesting. It costs yeah. the profit. That basically what has created the profit, right? Because if you look at that budget cap, I mean, and so let's just go to their profit. Uh, what was it? They were down to eighty three point eight million. Um, what do you call it? Uh, pounds mm -hmm. from eighty nine point seven in twenty twenty two. You know, that's basically the difference between what they used to spend and what they now spend with the budget cap on mm -hmm. all the bits that fall under the budget cap, which doesn't include, uh, you know, um, salaries for the the important people that make that write the checks. So <laughs> as a comparison, Red Bull Red Bull Technology, the company behind Red Bull's F one team, had a turnover or revenue in twenty twenty two of three hundred and eighty five point six million pounds. Hmm. So big money. Big yeah. money they should, over there. They should make sure that they don't let Andretti in because Andretti will steal all of that money. It <sighs> gobble it all up. Yep. You're going to put it in their cowboy hats and their cowboy boots <laughs> and, you know, slap them the spurs. America's here. We're take and we're going to, we're going to dress up our 70 ounce steaks <laughs> with your money. Sorry. Yeah. Um, moving on. So Honda has targets an F1 title bid with Aston Martin in 2026, by the way. Uh, mm -hmm. is one of the comments out there. As they continue their love, their hot, cold relationship with F1. <laughs> For one week they're in, one week they're out. Who they're with, that sort of thing. But uh, kind of that way be... with all motorsports. Well, except for IndyCar. They've kind of just always done that. Mm -hmm. You know, until they until that, that comment came out earlier this year about them potentially looking at leaving IndyCar, they've mm -hmm. been a stalwart of that. But you are not – you are – uh, right in terms of you know across everything else from uh, sports cars they've been in and out at times with the Acura brand um, 
slightly. You know, actually, since they came in, they kind of stuck with it. But mm-hmm. the MotoGP, they've always been very committed there. That's for sure. Mm-hmm. Um, but yeah, they they definitely Formula One though. They are they are hot and cold. It's an interesting you know, relationship. I I mean, just a little bit of a unsolicited advice for the Honda branding department, marketing department. I from me from my perspective, it just doesn't feel like Honda has a really good performance brand, right? Like obviously Chevy, Ford, even you know Dodge is has has a legacy performance brand to it in the United States, and I think Toyota had a tough road to hoe with theirs, but they've created this like performance identity with TRD and done a good job with it, marketing it up to us um, in the U.S. with TRD, and Honda to me doesn't really, right. Like they have mm-hmm. Type R, I guess. Yeah. Well, they but like they had HPD for a while, and that just t- to prove your point, just renamed to HRC Honda Racing Corporation. So they just right they can't they even just, stick they with don't something. have a great performance brand, right? So hmm. I think that they've probably struggled. That's probably where they've struggled to to find that fit. And I think that Toyota struggled with that when they yeah. started, you know, in in the U.S. and NASCAR. Not that NASCAR was the first time Toyota came to the U.S., but like it was the first time they really started marketing their performance identity in the U.S., at least from my perspective. Mm-hmm. Um, You're not wrong. And, and You're it was, not wrong. You know, it was really TRD, as I thought, that the TRD brand is where they really started to gain traction. Yep. Um, and, and then in the Which last they've now decade, changed, by the way, slightly. What's that? Well, it's slightly started to shift to the Gazoo Racing deal, the GR deal, for some mm-hmm. of their performance stuff now. With the Supra, the GR Supra, and you have the uh, Corolla and the Yaris Abroad that have all become sort of that GR moniker. So, But it just, yeah, I mean, it's like to, it just seems like Honda hasn't found that brand that will stick for them across, hmm. you know, all motorsports to me. That is, that is interesting. One brand that does have performance pedigree and has always had it and will have it till the end of time, most likely, is Ferrari. And they <laughs> have likely. been making a leap at a super team. And I, I, when the news about Lewis Hamilton came out, we had already talked about it a bit on this podcast, but they had obviously been making bids at putting people around Lewis Hamilton that can turn this team around. It started with the, you know, bringing in Frederick Vassar as the team principal, and then subsequently many different hires and rumors behind that that have uh, come to fruition in terms of engineering talent, that sort of thing that they're trying to bring over the Ferrari, not just trying to hire Lewis Hamilton and hope it all turns around. Well, one thing that I saw on the internet, and I don't have this super confirmed, so take this as a grain of salt. We could be being pranked, but one name that keeps popping up that everyone thinks could potentially be making a move is Adrian Newey. The incredible I designer, you were Chad Knauss. Yeah, Chad Knauss is headed to Ferrari. No. <laughs> uh, Adrian Newey, the incredible designer, uh, most successful designers of F1 cars, um, definitely in the modern era, uh, was cited in Marinello potentially. Now, could have been mm. on vacation, could have been picking up his latest <laughs> road going Ferrari, or is there discussing the possibility of joining them as a designer? going forward and what what would it be like for Adrian Newey to meet with Lewis Hamilton at Ferrari all in an attempt to get Lewis his eighth world title. That would be quite a storyline for F one. Something that could gather billions and billions of dollars worth of interest. Um I we will see. I can tell you one thing. I just hope for all of our sakes that the cameras are rolling right now. <laughs> I hope that the cameras are rolling on all of this because I would love to know a decade from now or whatever, whenever what the real, what the story is like, what it took to put it all together. I hope that Lewis ends up getting his eighth title. Um, I will be a Lewis Ferrari fan. I know I will. Hmm. I think they're shaping up for, you know, I, you're, you're getting me by, by, by you're getting me excited for this as a fan by talking about the rest of the details, right? Like, it's not just Lewis to Ferrari and let's see what happens. 
mm-hmm. you know, it is it sounds to me by what you're the way you describe it that Ferrari is like this is our shot, right? I hope that you know it'd be interesting to know if the background stories of this is like blank checks and you know just calling everybody and throwing you know throwing everything at everything to make this happen um that'd be an interesting hell of a story so would be there is we have to say there has been rumors and conjecture that adrian knew he could be talking to Aston martin as well as lance stroll lawrence stroll sorry the dad uh tries to make that into a world champion championship team um and once again when you talk blank checks throwing that at adrian newey could be a possibility for uh we did we didn't actually say it on here because it happened right after we recorded last week fernando alonso did resign with aston martin thank you fernando great choice if adrian newey does go there for (laughs) once he may have made the right choice this may be (laughs) a whole turn for everyone in that fernando alonso for once just stayed put (laughs) And made the right choice. We'll see. Chances are, chances are they told him they were talking to Adrian Newey, so he just like, oh yeah, let's do it. Signed up. Yeah, and then here we go. Like, Where do I sign? <laughs> and then there's like, well, oh wait, never mind. He's going to Ferrari. <laughs> Sorry, Fernando. That guy. Well, he's still got about 42 years probably left to drive since he's never going to stop. <laughs> so, uh, well, that's it for the F1 world. Uh, just talking about IndyCar real quick. They're headed to Long Beach. This weekend, one of the coolest IndyCar events of the year. Um, they will be using a new aero screen, a thinner material yeah. one that also has some uh, scoops built into it for air for cooling, since that's been a huge issue is the heat inside those cockpits for the IndyCar drivers. Um, and a little lighter, which can be nice for some of the CG uh, issues they fought in terms of just the weight that that aero screen added to the top of the race cars. Also, this photo we have in our notes, the man on the left looks suspiciously as he looks at these two arrow screens, like um, who's the celebrity chef guy that swears? <laughs> Gordon, oh, Gordon Ramsay. Yeah, that, is, that yeah. is the IndyCar version of Gordon Ramsay. I don't know who this man is. We Maybe Josh can put this <laughs> for anyone that wants we'll to know. on Twitter and watch this, yeah. watch this video. Um, Why is Gordon that, Ramsay looking funny. at these so <laughs> intensely? Well, so where is this coming from? I get the vents. Um, that's that's a cool feature. You know, Probably long overdue, honestly, that change yeah. uh, for the drivers. And the, the the vents are kind of a pretty sleek look, so I don't think they're you know that there's one at the bottom, sort of two at the top. Um, the them being lighter is that just you know a request? Um, is, it was the CG issue like really that much of an issue for them affecting the cars? They, I, from what I gathered, and I don't know if this had a huge effect. You know, that was a major uh, change in the handling of those cars was the weight mm-hmm. that that thing added and put on so high up. So mm-hmm. I don't know if this is a request, that sort of thing. I think it's just, it is thinner. Iteration. It's, technology. It, yeah. It's newer um, generation. It's about We're seven. probably making a bigger story out of something that is just normally just goes on. It, this is just I, iterating. I was just going to pop in and say it's seven pounds less, but it's just as strong. It's a newer polycarbonate material than the old one. So they're, it's cool. that's just an improvement, I guess. That's cool. I really just wanted to talk about this Gordon Ramsay man on the left. So <laughs> this photo. <laughs> His name is Dave First, by the way. So okay. Dave, if you're a listener. Dave, yeah. You may be able to do some uh some doppelganger lurk for Gordon Ramsay. <laughs> <laughs> um uh just something from the Formula E world, uh Porsche pretty upset. So after the latest race where the uh, Felix da Costa was actually claimed his first win of the season Mm -hmm. and then had it taken away because the scrutineers found an uh, ineligible, I guess, throttle piece, um, throttle damper setting that was related to the spring that was fit inside the car. And I didn't fully understand this, but I guess essentially what it was is that there was a – it's like not a performance part as much as the – the rule book had been updated and maybe it hadn't been checked. And so multiple teams were running this part. Well, nonetheless, they were DQ <laughs> for this and they've been quite upset. Even as going as far to say they have the impression and feeling that not all teams are treated equally. Interesting. So, well, don't um, those guys have some real, like is, is saving battery, like the driver controlling the battery save a big issue with those teams? Like they are the race, so complex. A yes. big part of the strategy. 
Yes, it's best is managing it, the energy. Is it possible that they had something funky going on in throttle spring to allow the driver to just go to a certain throttle percentage and and hold it there more reliably to conserve battery? Well, I think that was the point, though. I think this, the reason the uproar was that so the the way the some of the um, feedback and and to your to the way you're thinking, yes, like as racers, we immediately think like, well, what was the performance advantage? Because they don't, mm-hmm. no one does anything for whatever the cost is saying and Porsche is saying about being yeah. angry and offended by this. I don't care. I'm not listening to that. They were cheating. <laughs> <laughs> whatever they were doing, they were cheating. They were trying to win. So, they were cheating. To be the but to be fully fair, that the way it said is that basically when the Gen three car. Things that were basically add add or added, they mm-hmm. were highlighted. But things that would be were move, removed from their sort of catalog of what was allowed and not allowed, uh-huh. wasn't pointed out. And so somehow this part made it through into the new cars. They say other teams are using it. I don't know, but hmm. some controversy from the. We'll have to dive into more. We'll have to have get more information on that. But that was the that was the level of what I had read. And uh, was able to understand. And at the end of the day, if Porsche is right, that is a seriously draconian penalty for having something that maybe a lot of teams are running and and you know slipped its way through. It's also the rules, and therefore <laughs> that's how it goes. So True. welcome to motorsports. Anything else on your mind? I think that's it for me. No, um, that's it for me. I think. Yeah, I uh, I I don't I I laugh about just one last note about this Formula E and like just European mm-hmm. mindset of things. I'll kind of take our last sixty seconds to talk about this. Um, I I if it if it truly is this draconian DQ like you said, right? And it's a non-competitive part, and it's just this big thing where it was totally unfair. Um, it is funny to me that it's like another one of those FIA European style officiating things where they like there's no soul in what they do. Yep. Sometimes. Yep. <laughs> you know, where in NASCAR, like we criticize NASCAR all the time for being inconsistent and, in, you know, whatever. But like we are just stock car racers, Americans just here. You know, they're just trying to put on a good race and make good racing. And we care about like this, the the beauty of the sport, right? And sometimes it feels like, you know, FIA is, you know, in, in European motorsport is just like, like you said, dr- this draconian, you know, government, over government, over legislated, yeah, um, sanctioning body with no soul for the sport. Yep. But <laughs> I don't know. <laughs> I don't it does it. seem very serious. And I don't sanity. believe it. Like, there's I, no I room think for as a racer, I know that they're trying to win. And if the race, if the, if the team that won the race had an illegal part on their car, they were probably doing it on purpose. <laughs> <laughs> Those teams have twenty five million dollar budgets. They didn't overlook the throttle spring. <laughs> I that that's been my thought process. So, yep. <laughs> uh, I when we started this pod, by the way, today you were literally dealing with a siren from a tornado siren. Yes. Right, I think and clear, though. there's no yeah we postponed this a little bit uh, by a few minutes and check for the hail and because of that we were starting a little bit late so we're gonna oh, have I to took finish up the last this, minute just now you did just take up the last minute and therefore Kyle Bush who is sitting over here so patiently enjoying the snacks we have in the green room we won't have time buddy we're sorry so we'll have to just try again next week and hopefully sorry, no Kyle. tornadoes or acts of God will get in the way of you getting on here Kyle but it's not gonna happen so that's it for the Money Lap podcast. Peace. Thanks for listening to the Money Lap. As always, check out themoneylap.com for the best five minutes in motorsports or sometimes just the coolest stuff in motorsports. Delivered directly to your inbox three times a week. Check us out on YouTube. We're growing fast over there. And, of course, Twitter, TikTok, Instagram. We're all over the Internet. We're spreading the word of how cool motorsports is. Check us out.